Okay, so here we have the uh, Rock Bottom EQ. Let me give you a clean tone sample here. And then we'll uh, go over the uh, frequencies that I chose here. Now this one right here, um, I set the frequencies to ones that I basically like. They're kind of more bass and baritone oriented. Uh, so we have 62 hertz, 125, 500, 1K, and 4K. Again, you can set these to be whatever you want. It's just that's the ones I picked because uh, that's the ones I liked. I went with the uh, frequencies for like 62 hertz uh, because if you got a good sound system when you're playing live that has really good subs, you can kind of boost that up. Uh, if you're in a sound system where uh, the subs are not so hot and you don't want to blow them up, then you may want to cut that. The 125, if the sound system doesn't have really great subs, <clears throat> you can cut that 62 like I said earlier, but then you could boost the 125 to give it that effect. But 125 is also kind of where things get a little muddy, so in certain sound systems you may want to cut that. 500 is on there. 500 is one that's usually the mud frequency, so you probably want to cut that. But if you got a sound system that has absolutely no bass and no subs, you can bump up the 125 and the 500 to basically fake <laughs> that you have uh, subs in your sound system. Then you have the uh, 1K, which is kind of the cherry frequency for when you're trying to cut yourself in or push yourself out uh, in front of the mix. So if you want to hear the tone of your instrument, that's usually heard within the 1K mark. That's what makes a, a Fender sound like a Fender, a Gibson sound like a Gibson, active pickups sound like active. So, and so on and so forth. And then the 4K is kind of where you're starting to get into the uh, mix with everybody else with the high-end stuff. You're, if you're playing bass and you're trying to get into a mix with a guitar and a singer, you probably want to cut the 4Ks because that's getting into their territory. Same with cymbals and whatnot for drums. But it's there if you want to boost it because if you're inside uh, uh, just your bedroom playing around, you can bring up a lot of the, the sparkly tones, if you will, with the 4K. So that's, that's just uh, my example here. But enough gabbing, let's actually hear how this sounds. So let's uh, fire this up. Right now, all the knobs are straight up at unity with the exception of the volume knob. So the unity position, it is a boost and a cut. So unity is at top dead center, noon if you will. So let's uh, actually put on a RTA analyzer here real quick. Just got a free app on my phone to do that. Let's see if this will show in frame. Perfect. So you can see that's Unity. Watch as I raise the 62. You can see that it went up. And you can see that it goes down when I tell it to go down. Go for the 125, which is already pretty booped. Boosted up here. Sounds kind of thin. Do the 500. Kind of muddy. Scoop it out. 1K. See that it went up. Now it's going down. My voice kind of throws it off though. And then the 4K. So that's pretty much all the frequencies uh, that this one's doing. But uh, let's go take a look at the circuit and actually see what's going on underneath the hood so that you can set your own frequencies to your own heart's content. Let's take a look at a real quick uh, block diagram here before we go jump into the schematic. Um, it's only really a four-piece block diagram here, but uh, to set up a EQ pedal, first thing you need to give it is a power supply. And this will set the, uh, the rails and the bias for all the op amps and stuff. Uh, from there, we take the guitar signal input and set the impedance and clean up the frequencies with an input buffer. Um, from the input buffer, we go into where the actual magic is really happening within the EQ, uh, which is called a gyrator circuit. And that's where you 
set things like your, your cuts and your boosts of all the frequencies that you want to cut and boost. And then once it goes through all the gyrators, then it goes out to the output, and that's where you have your signal all cleaned up and spat out to your amp. Okay, so the first thing we have here is the power supply. Pretty basic, we just have ourselves a reverse polarity diode to keep the power good. Uh, we have a bulk capacitor here at the beginning to hold up the power, do a little bit of filtering of the battery coming in, or power supply. Uh, and then we have a little voltage divider right here, which uh, cuts the voltage down exactly in half, creating a bias for our op amps to come. And then a little bit of a biasing filter capacitor here too, to keep that smooth. Okay, so what we got here is the uh, input circuit. Uh, this is what will uh, be as a, act as a buffer and act as a boost. And we'll just go from the input and work our way out. So from the input, we have the R1 resistor, which is an anti-pop resistor, which goes into C1 and R2. This is what's creating a high-pass filter. And it's creating a high-pass filter with a cutoff rate of roughly 34 hertz. So basically anything that's under 34 hertz, I'm cutting out. Anything above that, I'm letting in to be amplified, tone shaped, and so on. Uh, that's basically to cut out things like the really low subs and parasitic DC voltage, because parasitic DC voltage you don't want going into your op amp. You, you're going to get a lot of garbage noise that you want to deal with. Um, the other thing that's set right here between the parallel resistance of R1, R2, and the internal resistance of this op amp, which you can find in its data sheet, uh, that, that right there creates the input impedance of the circuit. Uh, the input impedance of this pedal is kind of important because that's what you use to know if you're going to get anything like tone sucking or if you have like really, really long guitar cables uh, going into this. The resistance of the guitar cable is going to cause the, the sound to get dark. Um, the way to fight that is having a high input impedance on the pedal. Uh, in this case, you want to try to get somewhere around an ideal 1 mega ohm of impedance. But if you do the math of parallel of R1 to parallel of R2 to the internal parallel of this op amp, you'll get something around 385 kilo ohms. It's not great. It's not bad, though. That, that's still definitely usable. Um, but if you wanted to be ideal and get it to about 1 mega ohm of input impedance, if you changed R2 to 2.2 mega ohms, just like R1 right here, that'll give you roughly about 1 mega ohm of impedance. Uh, however, if you do do that, that does change this high-pass filter and that may not be something you wanted to do. All right, the next thing to take a look at here is the uh, op amp itself and the voltage gain that's going on right here. So we're gonna be boosting this signal into the circuit and here's how it's done. Under the negative feedback of this op amp, we have a set of resistors. Typically it's set by the, what would be considered R1 to R2 of the negative uh, input rail of the op amp, in this case R3 and R5. But as you can see, we have a little bit of a parallel resistance going on right here between R3 and R4. So the math, like always, is in the build doc expressing all of this. But what this will turn out to giving you is a voltage gain of 12, which if you convert voltage gain to dB, that's about a 20 dB boost. And we do want to boost this signal a bit because we're going to do some subtle cuttings and subtle uh, boostings upcoming in the circuit. Uh, another thing to notice here, too, is we have a low-pass filter here with uh, R3 and C2 before we do any of this uh, amplification, and that's basically a low-pass filter of with a cut around 16 kilohertz. So anything above 16 kilohertz, I would like to be cutting out. Anything underneath that, I'd like to be keeping in. Um, after it gets through all that, Bef right before we get into the, the uh, EQ, we have another, uh, we have another uh, low pass filter, sorry there, uh, which has a ridiculously high frequency cut, but uh, which calculates out to being about 106 kilohertz. Uh, the reason for that is, is there could be like staticky noise, staticky harmonics, just general real high pitch garbage that you don't want in your circuit, and this is a way to just kind of cheaply get rid of it. Okay, before we get into the next part of the circuit here, we want to go over a quick explanation of what uh, uh, peaks and notches are and what is Q, uh, which is a way of measuring the resonant frequencies of what's going on here. Uh, so what we have is, uh, if you've probably used things like a wah pedal before, 
uh, you understand that what it does is it takes a resonant bump in your signal and it gets moved around depending on how you cock the wah pedal. Uh, and this, uh, if this were to go in the opposite way, uh, it could be a notch as opposed to a bump that's uh, being moved around depending on how cocked your wah pedal is. Uh, this is a sudden reduction at a level of one frequency or a sudden bump. That's kind of what you're seeing right here is this bump, um, whether it be high or low. And then how, I guess, shallow or narrow versus how wide or expanded the bump is determines how much Q you have going on. So like in this example right here, you can see that you have a high Q peak with a very tall but narrow bump, and then you have a low Q peak with a shallower gradual bump. Another way to take a look at this would be to uh, uh, take a look at this little diagram right here. This is a high Q, and this is a low Q. They're both at the same exact frequency, it's just this is more of a gradual frequency bump and a, and a gradual frequency drop off and this is a sharper bump and a sharper drop off. Okay, so to understand how gyrator circuits work, I guess we gotta go over a little bit about filtering and how that would uh, apply here from an analog perspective. Now, a typical filter that'll set your notches and your peaks and your cues is done with having a, a main op amp to sum up all the stuff that you're doing, a potentiometer here to set how much we're boosting and cutting, and then what's known as an LCR filter which is set right here. Now if you were to do the math for this, you, know, you can choose different values for L, C, and R to get frequency points that you can boost and cut and by how much is this Q that we're looking for. The problem with doing it this way in the world of guitar pedals is though we can find very precise, you know, 1% accuracy resistors uh, on sites like DigiKey and Mauser and Farnell and Element 14, and we can find capacitors with a, a variety of values, but also with kind of a wider tolerance, like 10%. It's really hard to find specific values for L in a through-hole type design. So that doesn't really do us as guitar builders any favors, or guitar pedal builders any favors. So there's a way around that, of course, and that's what a gyrator circuit's designed for. So to get around this whole issue of finding inductors of specific values, how do we do this? Well. If you want to get this op amp here to do the boosts and cuts and set the Q of a frequency, sometimes the answer is more op amp. And that's what we do right here. We use another op amp down here uh, with, the, uh, with a capacitor and a resistor. And this little bit right here causes an oscillation in inductance or called a gyration, which is why this is called a gyrator circuit. So now the, uh, the, we have the capacitor and resistor that we had in the previous circuit plus another capacitor and resistor with this op amp to cause the gyration that acts as a virtual inductor and that is how we get around the uh, lack of inductors that we can get to make our guitar pedals and bass pedals do what we want. So we're here we have the 125 Hertz band of the Rock Bottom EQ. This is the gyre gyre circuit that uh, controls that. You'll notice that we have the boost rail and the cut rail and right here we actually have the specific frequency that it's hitting. The reason it's not exactly 125 is basically due to tolerances that you'll see from down here when we get to that part. But from this, we can determine that we have a boost and a cut, and we need to find out how much we boost and cut. Now you can use the formula that's found inside the build doc, but right here it is. It's uh, 20 times the log of RE plus RX over RX. So what's RX? Rx is the resistor value that's found here on the gyrator circuit. So on any gyrator, you just look for this resistor and you can plug that value in. And then the value for Re is, in this case, the R6 or R17, they're both the same value. And you try to keep it the same value for simplicity's sake, like right here. Uh, you'll find R6 at the end of the input buffer. And you'll find R17 at the beginnings of the output buffer. Well, if you do the math in this case, we basically get a 27 dB cut and boost. 
Now that we've determined the cut and the boost, now what we want to find out is, well, what frequency are we cutting and boosting? I mean, you can take my word for it that it's 127.8 uh, hertz, but let's actually do the math. So what you see right down here uh, is the frequency cut. And if you follow this formula out, it's 1 over 2 times pi times the square root of all your components that are in your gyrator circuit here. And if you do all the math, in this case, it comes out to being 127.795 hertz. Okay, so now we know what frequency we're bumping or cutting, but how much is that bump, that value for Q? And the value for Q can also be determined using this function right here, which is the square root of uh, the C7 capacitor and R10's resistor over the uh, C6 capacitor and the R9 value right here. And that will pop you out a value for Q. Now, the ideal value for Q that you're looking for is as close as you can get to 3. If you go too low, again, that's going to be a very wide hump of Q, and it might actually interfere with the gyrator circuit behind or in front of this, which you don't want. And we'll get unpredicted uh, EQing when you try to do, do stuff like that. Um, you also don't want to get it too skinny of a Q, which would be a higher value, because as you get closer to like 5 and 6, it starts giving uh, harmonic resonances that start adding noise into your circuit that you didn't really want. So the ideal value you're trying to tackle is 3. And that pretty much uh, covers the, the magic that's going on right here. The only other thing that might uh, also influence how the gyrator circuit is functioning is the actual op amp of choice. Uh, for the most part, you can use any op amp. It'll be fine if you use a TL072 or a, uh, a, four, a 4558. Those will all work really well. Where this becomes more of a problem is if you can find like an old LM308 like you'd find in a rat, they were notorious for being slow and having terrible slew rates, which means they were really bad with high frequencies. So if you tried to make an EQ pedal and you tried to you know, make a gyrator circuit for a very high frequency, the LM308 just couldn't keep up with it and you'll get some distortion and some la lack of sound, lack of noise, or well, lack of tone. So that's where uh, op amp choice can affect this, but primarily any dual op amp will work. All right, so this is basically the end of the signal chain right here. Once we take all the frequencies that we boost and cut right here, we pull them into this output buffer op amp, which sums up all that tone shaping that happened before it. Uh, once we leave that, we go and set the output impedance of the uh, pedal here. And you can determine that just like input impedance by taking the resistance of the op amp and the resistors going out. And if you look at the build doc, you'll see the math is, has been determined, but it comes out to being roughly 5 kilo ohms of output impedance, which is good. The rule of thumb is you want to keep it uh, 10k or under. The idea being that output impedance much, must be much lower than the input impedance of the next device, whether it be a guitar amp or another pedal. Once we have the impedance set, obviously, the next thing we got is some filtering. The uh, filtering that we got here, we have a high-pass filter with C14 and R19. Uh, again, if you look at the math in the build doc, it'll tell you that the, uh, the cut frequency here is around 16 hertz. So that's uh, saying, hey, anything that's under 16, like sub-bass sub frequencies and uh, low-frequency oscillation, uh, it's not going to let that stuff through, which is good. You don't want that noise in there anyways. Uh, you'll also notice that there is a low pass filter coming out as well, which is R18 and C15. That's basically set, if you look at the math, to cut any frequencies above 1.6 kilohertz. That might not be good for cer certain people. For like someone who's playing a bass or a baritone guitar or rhythm guitar, that's pretty ideal. But if you are trying to play a lot of high frequency notes, you're you know playing standard E tuning, you're playing clean solos, uh, especially high noted ones like a lot of bluesy solos, a lot of reverb, this might not be so good for you. In that case, uh, you want the, the frequency cut to be higher than 1.6 kilohertz. If you were to change C15 here from a 10 nanofarad capacitor to a 1 nanofarad capacitor, that would change the uh, cut frequency to 16 kilohertz, which is probably going to be good enough for those obnoxiously high notes that you're going to crank out of your guitar amp. Now, the, uh, after that, you got the, the basic volume knob, which just grounds out the output, uh, setting the volume. 
And I mean, that's pretty much it. That is the uh, the end of the circuit. And sound happens. <laughs> but anyways, uh, again, uh, let me know if uh, doing these schematic dive-ins are, are good. Uh, the maths, uh, I could go over them uh, on these videos, but I find it kind of boring and tedious to do that when I just have them right there in the build docs. They're pretty well laid out. But I mean, if we if you want to go over things like uh, just simple passive filters and active filters, where you can just focus on like one math equation and how everything's generated, we can do that. But yeah, just uh, let me know in the comments below if you like this. If you think this is boring, you want me to stop, just yeah, just let me know. So if you like videos like this, uh, smash the like button, and if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And if you want to support us, uh, head up to our web store, which is www.diyguitarpedals.com.au, and uh, purchase yourself a couple of kits. Cheers!